Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, here we are. We're at our, our Bible study for the week. And we've moved away from Galatians back into the Gospels to see if we can uh, recover some of the images about uh, where law and grace balance and, and whatever happened to the law when we misunderstood grace. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn to Mark chapter 1. I want, I want to start with some thoughts with you. Uh, and then we're going to move in a, a specific direction with, with Yeshua tonight. In Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 4 and 5, is Mark is writing about uh, John the Baptist. And he says, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Now, let me give you some context for that. The last prophet in the Old Testament was Malachi. It's 400 years later and a prophet shows up. Uh, that would be like when the Puritans landed on Plymouth Rock, somebody preached a biblical sermon, but we haven't heard one biblical sermon since in America, and all of a sudden somebody shows up uh, preaching the message of God from the Bible. You know, I, I didn't say they weren't religious. Religion kept on going on. You know, through, through, the, uh, through the Greeks, through the Romans, occupations, we, we still had temple worship going on. So the, the people were living with what they thought was a reflection of Torah. They didn't have, they, did, they weren't following the Torah, but they didn't know they weren't following the Torah. I mean, there, there's just a tremendous parallel between what was going on there and what's going on in our country today. And you can't fault people for not doing what people are not telling them they need to do. And you can't fault people for doing things which the Word of God says are an abomination to God when they're going to church and no one is telling them that's an abomination to God. And so if, if, you, if you come into uh, an understanding of Christianity, which is all grace, then that's what you think the whole Bible is about. And John the Baptist, I, I like the way Mark writes it, John the Baptist appears in the wilderness. Now from everything we can determine, he was probably raised by the Essenes, which were a pretty conservative, uh, certainly would be more in the Hasidic line of Jews today, who had positioned themselves totally against what was going on in the temple. So the Essenes were a group of Yahweh believers who believed that the main thrust of Judaism in the temple, with all its observance of the festivals and everything, was a totally corrupt institution. So that's what John grew up with. He grew up with a group of men who did what the Bible says, who believed what the Bible said. And so I'm sure he grew up with a not too pleasant um, understanding of the Pharisees. And in fact, uh, at one point, the Pharisees show up to hear his preaching, and he says, who warned you, you brood of vipers? So, so he did not have a a very favorable or honorable or politically correct understanding of the religion that people thought was God's religion. And it says he appeared. His, his appearing was drastic. I like the, I think Holy Spirit chose that right. It's, it's not that he shows up in Jerusalem. He shows up uh, as part of a group that's pretty well identified because the Essenes were out in the desert. They didn't even come into the city to mingle. 
there was no Facebook, no YouTube, no uh, you know way to get the message out. And so the average Jerusalemite probably had little knowledge that they even existed out there. And all of a sudden, somebody comes preaching. Uh, several years ago when uh, Donna and Jordan and I were out in Colorado. Uh, we were in Colorado Springs, I think it was. It was one of the cities there. And just wandering around in the downtown touristy area. It's summertime and, and all the little uh, ice cream shops and things like that are all filled with people. And there's a square there that's probably twice the size of this auditorium. And in the middle of the square is a, a young man, well young, he was probably in his mid to late 20s, preaching, he was a street evangelist, uh, preaching a message that basically was, you're all going to go to hell unless you give your life to Jesus. I mean, he wasn't pulling any punches. He wasn't trying to be polite, politically correct. He was dealing with the sins of the, of the nation, but more importantly, the sin of a sinner who's lost from God. And, I mean, it's summertime. He's preaching, and man, the sweat's pouring off of him. And he had a colleague with him, and what I realized, they were team preaching. So you go stand on your soapbox, you preach for 20 minutes, you're hot, go have some water, sit down, and the other guy stands up. And I'm watching this guy. I mean, he's preaching as if he's got a thousand people paying close attention to him. But as I look around, it would appear that nobody's paying attention to him. You know, just because he's talking doesn't mean people need to listen. And in a public space, just because you want to talk doesn't mean I can't go ahead and carry on my conversation. You, you have no right to walk into a public place and demand that I stop my conversation with my friend and listen to you. And so through all these little ice cream shops, people are sitting there drinking their lattes or drinking their coladas or, or, or eating their ice cream in, in, in animated conversations with one another as if this man doesn't exist. It's like he suddenly appears in the middle of a weekend day where all the tourists are out and all the people who don't have to work on the weekend are out and he chooses that time to appear in that square to preach. Now I dare to believe simply because I know how Holy Spirit works, that there were people who heard. Maybe not everything he heard. I, I dare to believe there were people who heard the word sinner and have never heard the word sinner in their life addressed to them. I'm sure while they were chatting with their friend and he said, you're all sinners going to hell, there were people who thought, well, that's not true. Now they're carrying on their conversation, but they're thinking, that's not true, I'm not a sinner. But the very fact that they heard the words is now causing them to think and reflect on it. So when I read this, I get this, this picture, except the difference is here. The difference is John does not go into Jerusalem in the middle of the city square and start preaching. It says that he appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So he shows up at the Jordan River. I tend to believe it's probably where the Jordan River crossing was, certainly in that area, and I believe, choose to believe that because that's the closest place the Jordan River comes to Jerusalem. And it says in, in my Bible that the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Now this, this is amazing. He's, he's preaching a message they haven't heard. It, it's not a join the club and you'll become prosperous. It's not a say this prayer and everything will be okay. 
and yet people are coming to him. There, there was a move of the Holy Spirit. And the move of the Holy Spirit was not a move anything other than getting right with God. It was a move of conviction. We're, we're seeing moves today uh, in the church and we're seeing uh, churches spring up, you know, supposedly overnight and, and, and amazing numbers come. And, and I'm not putting that down. We do need to understand what's going on. One of the fastest growing churches in Massachusetts is not too far from here. And it began several years ago on an Easter and I'm not sure of my facts, but I believe it was 50,000 invitations got sent out in the whole area. 50,000 cards saying, we're starting a new church, come worship with us on Easter. Great day to pick. Everybody wants to go to church on Easter. If you've been a Christian or been part of the church, you're disgruntled or whatever. A new church starting. And I'm told that it was between 350 and 500 people showed up out of 50,000 invitations. Uh, I don't know the answer to this, but there had to be another large church organization or church somewhere in the country that sponsored that. And I'm not against that. You know, if, if we had a church of 10,000 members and and we had several hundred thousand dollars to plant a new church somewhere, we do that. We might take a whole bunch of families and say, move there, and, and we're going to start a church. Um, but but the, the amount of money that went into the advertising, you know, what, what could happen in any church if you could send out a flyer to 50,000 people? You'd have to have a, a small church would have to have a lot of money to do that. That's why small churches don't do that. Plus, when, when they had that Easter service, they already had a ready-made band. Where'd the band come from? Where'd the song leaders come from? This wasn't like a Bible study that grew. It, it suddenly appeared. We're, we're finding that phenomena happening a lot in America. Okay, where somebody goes, we plant a church, and... and you know, it grows by several hundred and hundred. By the way, when they're growing that fast by the hundreds, most often the bulk of those people are people who are members of another church who left it. They're church hoppers. They're not, you went out and found yourself 500 pagans and got them born again and started a church. And again, I, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, putting that down. I, what I am saying is this that one of the hallmarks of that approach is that people walk into a church that reflects their culture. It is always a feel-good, positive, you'll prosper, you'll get ahead, God wants you to succeed message. And people want to get ahead and they want to succeed and, and so you walk in and, and, and there's a comfort you know, casual is the way that it goes and the hairstyles of everybody can be like a contemporary rock culture. But John comes in the wilderness and there's no evidence that he ever reaches out to Jerusalem nor does he go there at all. He begins preaching a message of a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and the scripture says the whole Judean countryside that means all the way up and down the Jordan River. That means all the way into Bethlehem, all the way into Hebron, all the way into where uh, Gush Etzion is now. All of that would be little villages all over the place, finally at Jerusalem itself. Now it's going to take you a day to get from Jerusalem to John's baptism. Think about that. You know, I, I would not want to hike it. But you're going to leave Jerusalem and you're, and you're going to walk and you're going to get there. Are you going to go back the same day? I don't know. I haven't done the analysis. I don't think so. 
maybe very energetic people could go there in the morning, hear something, and, and get back before nightfall. You probably did not want to be wandering around the Judean hillside in the dark, so they would probably travel in bands of people that would go together. Uh, when you get to the Jordan River, if you're going to spend the night there, you're going to sleep under a tree. Uh, Jericho exists, but I'm sure it did not have seven, you know, Motel 7s or 6s or whatever they are. Uh, it, it did not have that, so you're going to be camping out. By and large, you're going to bring your food for the day or two. You're going to be gone. Why would anybody... Why would anybody walk that long in the desert to the Jordan River to hear a man preach? See, see we, we've got to understand something that God does. And it's so far removed from our culture that, that we don't even ask the question, we just move on. He was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. If, if I advertised a, a big meeting and rented the, uh, the centrum for it, and I said I'm going to have a, 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 a conference there for two days and we're going to talk about how to prosper and succeed with God, you're going to get built up in the Holy Ghost. I could think of a lot of things to say and it might attract people. But what if my billboard said, come and repent. Uh, come and get right with God. See, see, nowhere within our experience, I'm talking about us in the year 2019, we don't have within our experience the ability to understand what's going on here. Obviously, it's by word of mouth. People have gone to hear John and had a radical change in their life. And the radical change in their life translated into this. They went back to Hebron, went back to Gush Etzion, went back to Bethany, went back to uh, Bethlehem, went back to Jerusalem and told their friends, I went out in the desert and I heard a man from God show me how far I was from God and I got right with God and I am now right with God. You need to get right with God. That was the message. It was, it was not come out here and, and hear a man who, who's going to build you up and, and tell you all the great things that can happen in your life if you follow God. He preached a baptism of repentance. A baptism of repentance. Come on. Now when we look through revivals in, in America, they bulk of revivals in America have been over this issue. Jonathan Edwards in, in Northampton at the, at the First Parish Church stands up in his pulpit and opens up his sermon of the morning and reads it. And by all accounts, he was not an exuberant preacher. He didn't run around like I do on Sabbath. <laughs> he didn't tell jokes. He, he didn't have cute things to say. He read his message. The title of the message today is Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. This is a run-of-the-mill congregational church in New England in the 1700s that everybody thinks everything's fine. Church is going on like the temple was going on here. We believe the Bible, we read the Bible, we go to church, the pastor preaches a message, we nod our heads, we say yes, we go out and we live our lives pretty much the way we please because church is all about what we do in the church building, it's not about our life. By the time he got finished his sermon, which I believe was well over an hour long, Jonathan Edwards was known for preaching sermons with 80, 90 points. Point number 79, point number 80, point number 81. He numbered his points. By the time he was approaching the end of his sermon, 
men and women in the congregation were crying out, God help me! And they began to run to the altar and fall on their face before a God who was righteous as they saw the difference between his holiness and the sinfulness of their own, their own life and saw how, how in danger they were of having nothing when they thought they had relationship with God. And over half the congregation that day fell before the Lord in repentance that started a revival that went like wildfire through the, through the New England colonies. George Whitfield was another one who, when he would come, would preach and, and, and people would pour out of the town. Whit, Whitfield would go into a town and every business in town would shut down. And at, when he would leave a town, most of the bars and taverns found out they no longer had any business. He'd come into a New England town, and the owner of the factory in town would say, we need to shut it because all the workers are going to go there anyway. Whether I let them go or don't let them go, they're all going to go hear Whitfield preach. And when they heard him preach, they came under conviction. They didn't come in here and preach and say, yay, God wants me to prosper. Yay, God's interested in my success. They came away realizing that the difference between a holy God and a sinful man, and the answer to that has been provided by God, but it requires repentance. It requires acknowledging you're a sinner. And so his, his revival spread. Whenever there's revivals, I think of the Wesley revivals. John, John Wesley in New York, uh, in, New York in, uh, in England. He would preach in the open air because the churches didn't want to hear his message. And he said, fine, if the people of the streets are not welcome in the churches, I'll take the church out to them in the fields. And Wesley could preach to tens of thousands of people with no PA system and be heard by every one of them. And the same experience. When he preached, people came under conviction by the Holy Spirit that apart from Yeshua being Lord of your life, not just a name, literally Lord of your life, that you are a sinner with no hope. And they repented. I was listening to Billy Brim today talking about the coming last revivals, and I got thinking, why is it when we think of revivals in the 21st century, our revivals don't include the message of repentance? Every revival had the message of repentance. There can be man-made revivals. Hmm? I mean, Billy Graham, my goodness. No, nothing more s simple than Billy Graham's message, and he preached it years, years after years after years and decades, and he'd preach a message, and most, his, most of his messages were confronting evil in our society, the degradation in our society. I can't imagine what Billy would preach today. And his messages, no matter what the theme was, all came to one thing. Apart from Christ... You are lost in your sin. And the answer is you need to repent. He most often didn't just say, you need to say this prayer and accept Yeshua. He said you need to repent. And then he'd say that amazing thing, I'm going to ask you from wherever you are in this stadium here to come, step out of your seat and come down in the field. And you're, here you're going to stand together and repent for God before God, and then accept Yeshua as the solution to the sin. And then he'd step back. I never heard him give it again. I'm not saying he didn't. I, every time I heard him, he'd give that one call, and he'd step back. And George Beverly Shea would lead the choir, just as I am. 
without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. Come on, that was the message. I have no claim, I have no inherent righteousness. I might be a brilliant man, but I'm a brilliant man on my way to hell. And I'm coming just as I am. I have no plea. I can't, I can't say I was baptized as a baby or I'm a member of a church or I'm a this or that. I have no plea except this, that the blood of Yeshua was shed for me because I'm a sinner who needs to be saved. And he gave that message. Most often at that point, he wasn't even as vehement as I am now. And then he'd step back. And the choir would sing. And from all over the stadium, five here, ten here, twenty here, and then pretty soon by the hundreds, and people would stream. I never in my life ever watched a Billy Graham crusade without, without dissolving in tears at the end of every service. I mean, one and two. He's not saying, now, now, on. and for those of you who have backslidden, let me give you one more call. He didn't have to do that because he preached a message that apart from repenting uh, for sin, you can't be saved and you need to repent. And I'm giving you the opportunity to do it. And then he'd step back and they would come. They would come. And I remember as a child watching that, I remember... Uh, as an adult, I remember as a pastor at times being able to watch crusades like that. And it's like, yeah, that's the Holy Spirit convicting people. That's not the preacher having to manipulate, having to say, one more call, one more call. I know there's still some of you out there. How far we've come as a church from recognizing there's one message that the Holy Spirit needs to speak to the world. My, 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 my. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. We found out eventually even the church leaders had to go and find out what was going on, the Pharisees. They're, they're making a significant undertaking. It's not like, well, it's just around the corner. Or turn on the TV and see if you can listen to them. Oh, I'm not interested in turn them off. This was a major move of the Holy Spirit that caused people to do things. Smith Wigglesworth shares many experience, experiences of being in the middle of preaching a crusade in a town and the anointing of, uh, of repentance would get on him. In one case, he's walking down the car of a train, and as he walks by a Catholic priest sitting there, the Catholic priest falls out into the center, gets on his knees and says, Man of God, pray for me. I'm a sinner. He didn't even say a word to him. There, there, in those revivals, there'd be people who were trying to walk down the street and just felt they had to go into a church. Never been in a church, but something tell, told them, you need to get in that church right now. And they go in and get born again. Why? That was the Holy Spirit doing his job when the church is willing to stand up and preach the message. And so it says in verse 5, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him. Confessing their sins. Agreeing that the message of the scripture is true, that apart from being born again, one is a sinner. Same chapter, Mark 1, move down to verse 14. This is after the temptation of Yeshua in the wilderness. John has been taken by the king and put in prison. By the way, because he was preaching that it was unlawful for Herod to be married to the one he was. Verse 14, after John was put in prison, Yeshua 
went into Galilee. Now let's get the picture. You've been to, with me to Jerusalem, I mean to Israel. John is preaching in the area of Jerusalem, the Jordan River, Judea. He's put in prison, and Yeshua went into Galilee. That tells me Yeshua was still down in John's area. But as soon as John is put in prison, Yeshua heads up to his area. He heads up to the Sea of Galilee. After John was put in prison, Yeshua went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. Now just stop there. Whew. I'm glad we got to some good news. I mean, you know, John's a heavy character. Repent. <laughs> Repent. Be baptized. Confess your sins. You know, that's negative. We don't want some negative stuff. We want some positive stuff. Hey, we finally got to it. We're not that many verses later. Mark is kind of a condensed version of all the Gospels. And, and, and it says so clearly that he goes into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. What is the good news of God? Keep reading. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. We get over into Paul's letter to the Romans. And this is where we, where we got to be careful when we take things out of context so that we read something as if the people hearing the letter didn't know the full context. When Paul writes to Timothy and says, all scripture is inspired by God, everybody who heard that knew that it didn't refer to Ephesians because Ephesians hadn't been written yet. When they heard all scriptures inspired by God and is profitable for teaching and correcting, they, they knew that it was referring to the Torah. In the likewise, in the Jewish mindset, if I said the Lord is my shepherd, I didn't need to say any more. As the scripture says, the Lord is my shepherd, and now I go on talking, but the minute I said the Lord is my shepherd, you good Jews knew the whole 23rd Psalm, and in your mind the whole thing read out, ran out. Yeah, yeah, I didn't have to teach it all because you thought it the minute I said it. Yeshua comes and he preaches a message based on what John the Baptist has been teaching. And so he says the kingdom of God has come, repent and believe the news. Good news. Paul comes and he's trying to explain how can that be. And he says, if you confess with your mouth Yeshua is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And my question is, is that all there is to it? Because if that's all there is to it, Paul just eradicated a major part of Yeshua's message, which is repent. Come on. He's trying to explain how the transaction takes place. It requires two things. It requires a belief and a saying. If you believe Yeshua is the Lord, you will have repented. Anybody who says, I believe in Yeshua but hasn't repented, hasn't believed. And so John, when he comes to write his first letter, will say that if you say you love God, but you do not love your fellow man, you're a liar. Well, aren't words important? Yes, but words are validated by actions. If you say Jesus is Lord and then you go and decide what to do with your life, he's not Lord to you. He's not some kind of cosmic Lord sitting over there like, hello, Mr. President, hello, Lord, hello, this. The very word, my Lord, means that he has the personal 
responsibility to direct your life. And Paul will use the word, that's why we're slaves to him. I'm a bond servant, says Paul. Where do we ever get the idea that Paul would think you could say Jesus is Lord, but you don't see yourself as a servant to do what he says? Where'd that idea ever come into the church? Came out of the pit of hell is where it came from. And so gradually the message got watered down, so just say this prayer. How on earth can you say a prayer with no context? I make you my Lord. What on earth does that mean? Would somebody please explain it? You know, Schombach, when he would talk to people and he's going to pray for their healing and everything, and he'd ask them right away, are you born again? He says, well, the most important thing is to get born again. And then he'd ask people, do you smoke? <laughs> yes, I smoke. Well, if you're going to get healed, you can't smoke, so you've got to get rid of smoking right now. I mean, right in front of people, uh, the whole thing, he'd address it. Well, that's, that's, in, that's not invasive at all. That's not invasive at all. You join the military. You raise your hand. You take an oath of allegiance to the military, and the very next second, that sergeant there is going to order you everything to do. He's going to tell you what to wear down to your underwear and socks. <laughs> one sergeant said to a, a GI one time, he says, Sir, do I need to get permission to have a wife? The sergeant said, If the government wanted you to have a wife, they would have issued you one. <laughs> True, okay? But, but we have this image that we can come to Jesus short of repenting. And I submit to you on the basis of the Word of God that if there's no sense of having had to repent to come to Jesus, you haven't come to Him. You've been deceived. You've been misled. Well, that can't be. I mean, I'm very enthusiastic, Pastor. I'm, I, I'm all excited. Wait a minute. Yeshua says in the end times, there's going to be many, many people who say, Lord, Lord, and he's going to say, I never knew you. Why? Many people have been deceived and led to the fact all they had to do is say a prayer. They didn't have to change their life. They didn't have to stop doing things the Bible says are wrong. They didn't need to change their promiscuity. They didn't need to change their drug habits. They didn't need to change their lying. They didn't have to change anything because the law has been done away with. That is an abominable teaching because it's setting people up to think they're in when they never were given a choice to get in. And what I mean by that is this. Had you told me I needed to repent, I would have. I didn't know. I didn't know. Glory to God. Are you, are you still with me? And, and so he said, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come, repent and believe the good news. And all I want to know is who erased the word repent from the Bible? I don't hear it. I don't hear it with my favorite preachers. And, and, and I'm not putting down their ministries. They go great and powerful. God deals with what he can deal with. And God's limited by your knowledge and my knowledge. God can't drive truth through me that I'm not, not open to, to receive. But, but I hear that far too often. Just say this prayer. Where is repentance? Because that's what it's all about. You were a sinner. And you know, the truth of the matter is, under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, people know that's true. Because this is what was going on here, and it's what's going on in every revival. Jonathan Edwards is just reading this thing, and people are being convicted, not by Jonathan Edwards, they'll be convicted by the Holy Spirit. That they need someone to save them from their sinful nature. Because the sin nature will kill you. Glory to God. 
Repent, the kingdom of God is here. That's the good news. My, my, my. Turn to Mark chapter 3. You still with me? You know, we're, we're, we're going somewhere with all of this because we're setting ourselves up to start walking through the teachings of Yeshua and begin to see them as commands. Now, you do not need to follow the commands of Yeshua. You do not need to. But then you're not one of his. Uh, that, you, you know, you're, you're a free person. You can, I'm not going to do what he said. Well, that's fine. But then you're not one of his. And he's very clear to say that. I don't know about you, but I want to be one of his. Mark chapter 3. This is the experience where um, Yeshua's mothers and brothers arrived and they're outside and they want to talk to him and uh, some in the crowd say, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Verse 33. Mark 3.33. Yeshua, when he's told that, says, who are my mother and my brothers? Now, I'm not interested in being Yeshua's mother. But I do want to be his brother. And, and one of the great teachings of, of Scripture is that Yeshua can hold the position of Lord and Master and be a brother. And if you want an example of that, you need to go and reread the story of Joseph. Joseph had a vision that he's going to be powerful over his own family and uh, they kind of resented that and sold him into slavery. At, at the end of that story, Joseph is the second most powerful man in all of Egypt, but his power is used to save his father and his brothers. So they're in a position where he has more power than you can imagine, but he's your brother. Yeshua reveals that God, Yahweh, is our Father. He is God. He's righteous. You know, he's, His very holiness will consume, not because He's angry, but because holiness consumes all that is unholy. But at the same time, He's your Father. Glory to God. Yeshua is the righteous judge who's, who's come to, to uh it will, will be coming again to rule in that righteousness. But he's your older brother. So he says there, Who are my mother and my brothers? Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him, and he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Watch this, verse 35. Whoever does the will, does God's will, is my brother and sister and mother. Notice, he does not say, whoever says a prayer is my brother. Whoever adopts correct theology is my brother. Whoever goes to church every day is my brother. Whoever becomes a pastor is my brother. No, no, no. Whoever does God's will. So if you really want to be in the family of God and, and, and we want to be brothers and sisters of the Lord, he's going to evaluate that based on one thing. Are we doing what God's word says to do? Now, that doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you're doing everything right. But is your heart to do what God says or have you taken major portions of the Word of God and shifted them aside, and I'm living my life in this earth journey doing what I want to do? I, I, I submit to you that we don't, we don't live in a culture where that's easy. I don't find that easy. You know, I, I, you know when you come to 50 years of ordination, you can look back, and, and I see some great things that God was able to do, but... A lot of things, you know, God had to work with a guy that did what he wanted to do. Come on. I, I, I've had Holy Spirit tell me specific things to do. I didn't understand why, so I didn't do them. Come on. I, Holy Spirit at one point in my life was telling me that I want you to read more about healing, more about healing, more about healing. Well, I was well and healthy, and I, 
That didn't make any sense to me. And six months later, after he'd been saying that, there was a terrible accident in the family, and, and someone, two people actually died in it, and, and, and it's like, I was totally unprepared for that. You know, I, I walked into that room, and, and everybody's saying, that that's over, it's gone, it's, and, and it's like, I, God gave me six months to get ready to walk into that room, but I had other things to do. What? Watch TV, make sure I catch the nightly news, do things that I like to do. I had plenty of time in six months to do his will. And, and, and I didn't know what it was for. What if he says, stop doing something? Well, I always do that, God. I know you always do it. That's your flesh. Stop it. Well, if he's your Lord, are you going to do it or not? And Yeshua says, the ones that are in his family are those who do my Father's will. Not those who know it or talk about it. All right? Now, with that as a foundation, let's turn to Matthew 5. And starting tonight and for the next foreseeable months, we're going to work our way through parts of the Beatitudes He's going to talk about salt and light and who you are. And then he's going to talk about murder, what it is and isn't, adultery, what it is and isn't, divorce, oaths, eye for an eye, how to love your enemies, giving to the needy, prayer, uh, fasting, worry. We're going to find out if you worry, you're in sin because he tells you don't do it. That's a command. It's not an option. Do not worry is an imperative in the Greek. Every time you're worried and you're stewing about something, you are violating your Heavenly Father's command. That's a command. Well, I just don't know how to do it. We'll find out how not to do it because he said, don't do it. But we take it as optional in the life of a Christian and therefore the devil is getting victories he shouldn't get. But why? Because we're not doing what God said to do. But to kick it off tonight, I want to jump right into the basis of it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Matthew 5, 17, Yeshua is speaking. It's in red letters in my Bible. Do not think, or well, wait a minute, do not think. Don't, don't even think this way. Don't even think this way. I know what you're thinking, don't think it. Is that a command or not? See, one of the things we're going to learn over these next months is how to read these things as commands. We've never read them as commands. We've read them as suggestions or just a teaching of Yeshua or his opinion how on earth can the God of this universe have an opinion that isn't law? When God says something, it becomes law. When he says, let there be light, then the law of light overcomes darkness. It's spoken. <laughs> Come on. When he says, don't think about it, he means don't think about it. Well, maybe we can discuss it. No, you shouldn't even discuss it. If the church were obedient to just that one thing there, replacement theology and the, and the battle going on between law and grace wouldn't even take place. Because we wouldn't even be discussing it because the Lord of the church said, don't even think that way, and yet it's being thought that way and taught that way. Because we don't receive his words as a command. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Um, maybe if we read it in another version. Don't, don't even think that I've come to do away with. Don't even think it. 
If he said, don't even think that I've come to abolish or do away with the law, how on earth can a preacher stand up before thousands of people and say, Yeshua did away with the law? Those exact words. Yeshua did away with the law. How on earth can he say that when Yeshua said, don't even think that I came to do that? Come on, people. And because this message is going out further than just who's here tonight, I, I challenge you if you're watching this on Facebook, get to the Bible. What did he mean? Don't even think it. Don't even think that he came to abolish the law or the prophets. When he says that, law and prophets means all the Old Testament. When a Jew said it's written in the law and prophets, that means uh, he's referring to everything in this part of the Bible. Don't even think that I came, came to do away with it. Don't even think it. We not only think it, we're taught it. And people go to seminary and Bible school and they're taught to teach it that it's been done away with. Now, all I know is there's some confusing things Paul may say, but if what Paul said was that the law's been done away with, then Paul's in disagreement with Yeshua. And if that's true, I'm putting my stake on Jesus the Christ, Yeshua the Messiah. And Paul is a heretic. I don't believe that. Don't take this out of quote. I'm just saying, if what Paul said is he did away with the law, and Yeshua said, don't even think I've done away with the law, either Paul's a liar or you don't understand Paul. And that's what the previous four months have been about. That if we would understand Paul... He was not talking about doing away with the law and the prophets. He was talking about doing away with the minhag, the takanot, all the oral law of the rabbis. Do not even think that I've come to do away or abolish the law. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now that word fulfill them is very interesting. Now I've read some... Man, you get on the internet, people have all kinds of... Fulfillment meant he made, a, he, he made them complete, they're all done with, therefore we don't need to do them. No. So, he carried out all the Ten Commandments, meaning you don't need to. No. He lived the Ten Commandments perfectly, he never committed adultery, so that law is done now, meaning you can go and commit adultery? Because you're not under law? It's not even logical, but we're in a very illogical society. He furthermore goes this, for I tell you, let, let him explain it and then I'll explain it. Verse 18, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Let me ask you, have heaven and earth disappeared? then the law is still in effect. Now that word fulfill is very interesting. And when we read on, we're going to find out Yeshua exactly starts to teach based on how he understood the word fulfill. I've not come to do away with it. I've come, the word is filling. I've come to fill the law with its meaning. You only understood 80% of the law. I've not come to do away with it, but I've come to fill it with meaning so now you can understand the fullness of the law. law doesn't go away. It now comes to the point where you can grasp it. This is God's principle of teaching. Back in the Old Testament, he says, teach your children these things. We lived in Egypt. God delivered us. We went through the all the plagues and everything we got out, we got through the Red Sea, we got over here, you tell the story. And then Yahweh instructs his people, in the day when your child asks you, Papa, what are the meaning of these things? Then you will explain to them. Now, 
What's that principle of teaching? You teach a young child the basic facts, but you can't explain everything because they're not mature enough to understand it. Do this. Why? Because I'm dad and I say do this. Don't do this. Why? Because I'm dad and I say don't do this. You need to learn the principle of authority. The day will come when you might say, Dad, you know, I'm older now. Can you explain why I don't do this? Because if you do it, this is the result. And I can start showing you things in the world that are the results. By the time somebody's in their late teen years, I can take them to places in this very commonwealth to show them the results of wrong choices young people have made. Smoking, dope, alcohol. I can take you places where, where the result of their choices has ruined their life forever. Where their, their bodies are gone. I'm not going to do that with a four-year-old. I'm going to tell them, we don't do this. So if, if you ask the four-year-old in our house, he'll say things like, well, we don't eat that. You know, we don't drink that. There are just certain things he knows. You know, we, we don't eat corn. Except in that case, he'll tell you because it's filled with mycotoxins. <laughs> Does he know what a mycotoxin is? No, doesn't have a clue. Okay? But he knows we don't eat it. We can later in life begin to explain to him and show him the evidences of what happens when those things get in your body. In, in the same way, the law is given in the Old Testament by a God who says you're like children. I'm going to tell you do this and don't do this. Yeshua comes and he says, I'm going to fulfill the law now. I'm going to give it its fullest meaning. And if anything, Yeshua made the law tougher than it ever was. And we're going to find that in the next weeks when we go through uh, chapters, the rest of five and six and on into seven. You have heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that, and, and, and I'm, I'm striving to live that out, God. Okay? You, you've heard it said, thou shalt not commit adultery. But now I have come to make that law full of meaning. Let me tell you what it really means. If you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you have already committed adultery. What? What? I mean, back under the Old Testament, the law said, don't do it. You're telling me the law really means don't even think it. Isn't that how he started his whole, don't even think I've come to abolish the law. Come on. He, he talked about you shall not commit murder. Well, God, I've never committed murder, not even come close to committing murder. I'm doing oh God. And he comes along and says, but I say to you, when he says I say to you, what is he doing? He's making the law fulfilled. Come on, he's filling it full. Come on, you New Testament Christians. You thought that oh, we're under, under grace now. We don't have to do it. You don't have to do anything. You've got to do more than they did. Because I say to you that if you look at your brother with hatred in your heart, you've committed murder. What? What? Yeshua shifted all the laws and said if all you're doing is keeping them outwardly, you have an incomplete Torah. Is that not what the prophet said? The day's coming when I'm going to make a new covenant with my people Israel. By the way, the new covenant is made with Israel. It's not made with the Gentiles. Gentiles can be part of it, but when people like to call it, we're new covenant people, well, then you're part of the Jewish community. And how did the prophet say that was going to happen? I'm going to write my law on their heart. I'm shifting the law from a book. I'm shifting the law from parchment. I'm shifting the law from what is here, and I'm going to take that law, and I'm going to write it in your heart. Why? So when you live out your life, you don't need to say, oh, no, I have a difficult situation. I wonder what the Bible says. The law is going to be in your heart. 
You're going to so want to please your heavenly Father. You're going to look in your heart and you're going to be able to tell the difference between right and wrong in every single situation because the law has gotten off the pages of the Bible and it's gotten into your heart. The big shift between the old covenant and the new is that it's a shift of location of the law, not doing away with the law. That is so clear. That is so clear. My, 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 my. Glory to God. Well, let me, uh, let me read one last verse. I, I kind of hate to end with this verse, but I want to read it and get you thinking about it for, for next week. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. We started there and in, in, uh, that I, I, I've, I've come not to abolish it, to fulfill it. Verse 19, two verses later. Anyone, say anyone. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We're going to talk at some point about the law of tithing and, and how Yeshua was dealing with the Pharisees who were hung up on on the law of tithing as far as your cumin and your, your mint. You buy some mint, you got to tithe on the mint that you got. And Yeshua was criticizing them because while they were hung up on that, they were ignoring that there's laws about justice and mercy. And they weren't living those laws out. But even in that case, he says, you should have done the former, meaning, meaning the mercy and the without neglecting the later. He very clear said, you shouldn't neglect tithing on even the little things. Clearly said it. Clearly Yeshua taught that it's important that we follow the law from within our hearts. All I can tell you is that the more I get it into my heart to please my heavenly Father, the better I enjoy my life. Did you get anything out of this tonight? Father, we do thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that Holy Spirit will teach us and instruct us on things we need to know to live well-pleasing to you. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. We'll see you next week.